Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where you are watching this session. And, and welcome to, to my session in this uh, symposium on uh, transitioning uh, cultures of everyday food consumption and production. And I apologize for reading, but, but it has been, I've been trying hard this afternoon to retain the name of the symposium, but it has been impossible. It has been impossible. Especially welcome to this uh, session on uh, post-growth uh, food systems and politics. That I think that is, is one is, is very relevant uh, to start discussing those things now. So first, uh, and just before I enter in my presentation, I would like to thank uh, professors uh, Takae Kataoga, uh, Yatsunari Tsetsugo, and Stephen McGreevy for inviting me uh, as a speaker to, to this uh, symposium. So now, uh, just allow me to share uh, the screen with my presentation because this is my third try. I did it before. I've already been trying several, I mean, three times uh, before. And then in the, the good one, uh, I didn't share the presentation. So I don't want to make the same mistake. Now that you've said, uh, you have, as you have seen, I'm going to be fast uh, and probably the, the slides are uh, very many. And I will let the, the whole presentation for you to review and to read or to understand better some of the things that I'm going to say fast because I have now just less than perhaps 30 minutes. My presentation will be about uh, the normative valuation of food, either as a commons or a commodity. Um, in commons, uh, I will also uh, include the idea of food as a public good or, and, or as a human right, and how those normative valuations of food are extremely relevant because they shape uh, policy options. They shape uh, preferences and they shape uh, discarded uh, policy options. So yes, let's start. Food has multiple meanings. That's an obvious thing, very commonsensical. And the meanings are situated, uh, situated in place, time, and depending on the eye of the beholder. That's why those meanings are phenomenological. So food it can be different things for different people. It's not only one meaning that it prevails. And I'm going to explore the explanatory power of uh, the idea of food as a commodity, the dominant one in the current global food system, and compare with, uh, with the growing one, uh, a, 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 an emerging alternative valuation of food as a commons. And by commons, uh, and it's, it's important to emphasize also because there are several schools of thought on, on commons and commoning, by commons, I understand a social construct uh, in, uh, on, in the way to govern uh, resources, a resource uh, by a community, the way of governing and an institution, institutionalizing uh, a governing mechanism for specific resources uh, by a community, doing things together that's title that's called the common in with a purpose they do something for something and why is that because that that resource in principle is essential for the entire community that's why they devise this this governing mechanism and and what i'm going to do as i said is is that i'm going to contrast the the explanatory power and the importance of the social construct of food as a commodity dominant narrative in the industrial food system. Food is a commodity, therefore is ontological and not phenomenological. And therefore, as a, as a commodity, the best allocation mechanism is through the market. But what I'm going to defend is that this uh, uh, ontological social construction and food, it's basically driving uh, the earth beyond the planetary limits. Is basically destroying the earth uh, because of the greed uh, of the industrial food corporations uh, to maximize profit uh, using uh, resources at any cost. And actually, it's not just my approach. There is a, a growing consensus by different uh, panels and, and multi-author uh, documents by the UN and beyond and other institutions saying that the current way of producing and eating food mostly based on, on Western diets and industrial food production is unsustainable. So the business as usual is no longer an option. My research hypothesis, the hypothesis that I was using during my, my PhD that was finalized uh, three years ago, and it says that the, the foundation of this presentation is that the way we value food, the narrative of food, conditions the set of policies, governing mechanisms, and legal frameworks that can be proposed in the transition pathways towards sus more sustainable and fairer food systems for all. 
So uh, very quickly, I mean, the research pathway is structured into three uh, domains. The first one is that uh, how, do you, how did we reach uh, the current situation uh, where uh, food as a commodity dominates over food as a commons and how this uh, narrative was pretty much informed and sustained by the academia. The second one, how those narratives influence policy options with the case study of uh, food related professionals and how those narratives influence legal frameworks and, and uh, governmental positions using a, a case study with the US and the EU on, on the right to food in the, in the SDGs, in the Sustainable Development Goals. And finally, I will end up the, this presentation with a very quick uh, theoretical underpinnings of my approach to food as a commons. That it's a normative approach, but uh, it's not just based on, on theory, but also, also based in customary and contemporary food ex experiences. I'm sorry, what happens? Okay. That's it. I will be using a uh, discourse analysis because I will be focusing my intervention in, in narratives of food. Narratives understood as a set of coherent assumptions and principles to communicate a worldview, in this case, worldview related to food, and uh, narratives and frames understood as cognitive devices to define a problem, for, for, I mean, first, define the current problems uh, of the global food system define causal relationships between the, the problems and then the, the main drivers and the outputs or the undesirable outputs and the proposed solutions. Proposed solutions that are those that are feasible, accepted, legitimate by consider, considering, uh, accepted and legitimate by, by a given group and those options that are not accepted or are naive or they are considered as non-feasible non or non-doable by different reasons. So framings and the narratives are very important because they define the, the possible and feasible options and the discarded and non-feasible options because there is a moral valuation in, in every framing or in every narrative. So how have we reached the current situation? Well, the economies, they, they are pretty much guilty on, on, on that because the way of approaching to commons or to goods in general, it was based on, on just two features, rivalry and excludability, and, and apologies because there are some things that uh, uh, prevents you to read properly, but based on excludability and rivalry, they, they define four clusters of goods. Uh, positioning common pool resources, the commons, in, in those goods that are highly uh, rival, but at the same time difficult to exclude those common pool resources that were thoroughly studied by Eleanor Ostrom and, and her colleagues. Uh, but this approach, the economic approach to, to goods, it's highly reductionist, only based on two features, two, only two things. It's, and it's highly theoretical because there are many exceptions that they don't fulfill their, their considerations. And, and on top of that is ontological. They define what goods are not how goods are valued or perceived or considered, no, how goods are. So uh, I was trying to debunk this, this approach. So first I, I had to do this research, a systematic research uh, through Google with using the Prisma guidelines between 1900 and 2016, analyzing all the different academic literature that uh, was including the idea of food as a commons, food as a public good, food as a private good or food as a commodity and uh, the, with different combinations of searching tools. And I realized that uh, there was a sharp contrast between close to 50,000 uh, academic papers that were, were uh, the consideration of food as a commodity or a private good was included compared to only 171, 179 that were including the consideration of food as a commons and public good. And actually then I cleaned those, those papers and I came up with a group of 70, 70, only 70 papers where the consideration, alternative consideration of food as a commons or public good was explained. And I was analyzing those papers compared to a huge amount of academic materials that were positing, defending, or explaining in detail the idea of food as a commodity or food is a commodity and a, and a private good. But hopefully, I mean, and unfortunately also since the years 2000 and, and especially since the crisis in 2008, I mean, there, there is a growing number of papers devoted to those alternative framings of food. And how those framings, uh, how, how do they matter? 
why do they matter and how relevant they are those normative valuations of food uh, in order to shape uh, policy options or policy preferences. Well, in this paper that I published in 2017, I, I wanted to test the explanatory power of uh, both considerations, food as a commons or a commodity. So I was um, interviewing uh, 95 food-related professionals working in the in active in, in, regime, in the regime and the different alternative niches uh, and then they, those were active in the social network. So that's uh, I was considering them as a community of practice. And based on their responses, I could split uh, those, those 95 respondents into two big groups. One that was the gradual reformers, self-considered gradual reformers, and those that were uh, self-considered transformers. And gradual reformers were positively correlated to the monodimensional valuation of food as a commons, whereas transformers were correlated to the idea of, food, of multidimensional food as a commons. And that's an important thing, although due to the reduced sample size, I could not, of course, I could not find, I could not found, sorry, uh, find a causal relationship between, uh, between the political stance and, and the food consideration. Then in another paper the, the related to the, to the approach to food as a human right uh, in international negotiations, especially the, the US and the EU positions, the paper published in 2016, I came up with this, let's say, relatively striking uh, finding, is that food as a commodity is prevalent within those debates and pervades international negotiations. The consideration of food as a human right, it was even excluded from the SDG document. And uh, the US has, uh, recurrently and constantly been uh, against the consideration of food as a human right. Whereas the EU and the EU member states, they have a, key, a tiny, tiny or dual position. They support the, the right to food for, in, for international development for others to, to implement, but they are quite uh, timid, uh, if not even reluctant, to uh, enshrine uh, the, the right to food in their constitutions and to include uh, this mandatory right within their legal frameworks. Because at the end, both of them, they consider that as a commodity, the dominant hegemonic narrative of food, markets are, are the most efficient mechanism uh, to allocate food instead of rights-based schemes, as the case uh, for education or health in Europe, that are pretty much based on, on rights and entitlement. So just to end, uh, based on, those, and on that research, I realized that there was almost no theory of food as a commons, no, no theoretical elements that I could use uh, to defend my thesis, so I had to invent my own approach. My own approach based on the multiple dimensions of food. So those are six dimensions that I came up with. Uh, as you have seen, food as a renewable resource, essential for human beings, food as a human right, a cultural determinant, food has been governed as a public good uh, throughout history in several cases, but also food is, is a tradable good. Food is, marketed, uh, food is marketed and it has always been traded for, for thousands of years. So it's not, it's not a problem, I'm not against, I'm not against that. But this, this dimension, the tradable uh, dimension is only one out of many others, in this case, out of seeds, that are all those dimensions, all the others, they cannot be valued and monetized. They cannot be valued in monetary terms. Therefore, they can be tradable uh, using money as an exchange mechanism. Those other dimensions, they render food as a commons, uh, especially the essentialness of food for every human being. So food as a commons means revalorizing those different dimensions that are relevant to human beings, the first and foremost that we need food to survive, the value in use, and also reducing the importance and, and the leverage that has uh, at, at present, the, 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 the reducing the importance of the, the tradable dimension, the value in exchange, according to Marx's uh, Marx uh, vocabulary. And, and then as a, as a practical approach on how we could do those things, I, I developed at the end of my research this tricentric uh, proposal uh, where the collective actions, uh, partner states and social markets, the three vortex uh, of this pyramid, they should find a better balance. At present, the collective actions is pretty much cornered at the bottom left and occupying a very tiny space because the entire 
the 99% of the global food market is either occupied by private enterprises, the market itself, especially capitalist market, or by the command and control state, uh, the state that guarantees in some places a, a, a minimum uh, access to food for some uh, and for some non-privileged uh, people and people, you know, food, uh, the, the food poor, etc. So I propose a different type of market, social market. I propose a different type of partner state, and I propose that collective actions they they are supported and enabled to thrive. And I don't have time to explain uh, specific policy options you have seen in the right box on the right, uh, like farmer as civil servants or right base uh, food banks, etc. Because I don't have time now to do it. And just to end, uh, we can already, by the way, we can keep on the discussion, keep on discussing in the Slack and, and throughout the, the, the symposium. And I would be quite happy to exchange with you on that regard. So as, a as, as conclusions, commons and food have multiple understandings. And yet, so far, there is a dominant hegemonic narrative of food that, that sees food as a commodity or private good. Justifying, therefore, I mean, therefore, justifying market mechanisms as the one and only allocation mechanism. And this dominant narrative of food as a commodity has been crafted, or at least informed, by the academia, with a great amount of, of papers defending and, and explaining that, that uh, approach, that social construction. Uh, academia that has been instrumental uh, to provide uh, elements for policymakers to keep on pushing for that uh, social construction. And the economic narrative of food um, devote, I mean, let's say developed by academia is pretty much ontological and theoretical. And by being ontological prevents other food approaches, other food understandings, other food meanings. Hopefully, and, and, for, and fortunately, other food meanings are already growing, gaining momentum and thriving uh, all over the world. So we need also to nurture those, those uh, alternative uh, food narratives that they see food differently and they oppose to food as a commodity. Food as a commodity that is dominant within gradual reformers, those who want to just to gradually increase or technically improve uh, the, the flaws of the global food system. But conversely, the, the, consi the consideration of food as a commons or the multidimensional uh, consideration of food it's prevalent in transformers, in those who those uh, food agents that want to do things radically different. And the, the evaluation of food is correlated with a specific food preferences. A fourth conclusion is that the narrative of food as a commodity is dominant also in the governmental arena, not just in the corporate uh, world, but also in the governmental say, arena with different uh, governments already supporting this idea and therefore defending the market-based mechanism uh, as the only one, as the sole mechanism uh, to, to produce and distribute food, especially to those who cannot afford it. And the, the, the non-dominant narrative the fringe narrative of food as a commons or food as a human rights, it's although growing, it's a still minor, a minority. And the idea of food as a commons encompasses the, the human rights based mechanism. And this historical process of fully commodifying food, that it took several decades, it cannot be reversed overnight. So we will need multiple niches of uh, alternative constructions of food narratives, polycentric uh, niches. We will need uh, several decades uh, combining uh, alternative food networks, customary food systems, and contemporary food options uh, to rebuild the recommonification of food or revaluation of food as a commons, as a public good and human right. In any case, uh, just final thing, food as a commons, I think that has explanatory power and it's worth pursuing because it has policy power to uh, endorse and support alternative uh, food policy options. And in any case, we cannot, every, I mean, food provision cannot be exclusively left to, to the market. Food as essential for human life cannot be exclusively guaranteed by anyone's purchasing power. Uh, that's all, and I hope that uh, you will be you, you, you will be able to combine uh, this lecture with the other interesting presentations that we will see throughout uh, during this uh, this seminar. 
So uh, I will be glad uh, to keep on working with you, exchanging with you in Slack. Thank you very much. Good evening.